Bobby Utaro, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Although I have to say a few days ago here in Illinois, it was summer in 75, and now it's in the 30s and we're going to have snow tonight. So otherwise, I'm great. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. How are things out on the East Coast? Uh same, actually. It's been really warm, and then today it's been pretty cold, so I am getting ready for the winter. Yeah. Well, Bobby, you do some amazing work, and I would love to just jump right in and get to the heart of what you do. Can you tell us a little bit about your job, and we'll take it from there? Sure. Um, so for anyone who's listening, um, I am a rape crisis counselor, public educator, so I do my best to help people affected by sexual assault um, in any way I can. Um, and that's obviously a very heavy topic. So for anyone listening to please take care of yourself, you know, during this podcast um, and after. So please do whatever it is that brings your peace. Um, could be running, writing, you know, uh, praying, music, dance, something. Um, so just take care of yourself after. Uh, so, yeah, I've been doing this work now for about 15 years, um, trying my best in my own, you know, flawed human self to help people any way I can. Um, so that can be direct counseling. That can be um, you know, working with students on presentations that can be working with uh, significant others and family members, and even hopefully in ways that we might be able to prevent things uh, as well. So, um, I love working with people. I love talking to people like yourself. And when I work with different schools, organizations, I try my best to, uh, cater to their needs and whatever they think is relevant for that specific population, uh, at the time surrounding these issues. So it sounds like you have a lot of different areas that you cover. You are the person sometimes on the phone if mm -hmm. somebody calls in. Sometimes you're the person that's out in the community giving information and education mm -hmm. to encourage people to uh, do what they need to do in their next steps for their mm -hmm. healing, whatever that might be. You're out there talking to other folks about how they can be a support. And then you get into the legal stuff, how they can access what they need emotionally, uh, financially, and in other ways. That's a pretty broad experience you have. It's interesting when you bring up the legality. Um, I've never once and will never tell people to, that they must go to court, they must go to the police. Um, but if they have done something they want to and choose to, um, that I would support them. We get other people to support them as well. Um, and I recently have a woman now who is was interested in doing that, but she really... She says she can't do it. And I said, what do you mean you can't do it? Like, meaning, do you not want to do it? Or do you really think you can't do it? Those are two different things. Um, and she's just out of the place and, and that's okay. And she doesn't have to. But if there is a desire for her to, you know, uh, report crimes about her perpetrator, um, that she doesn't have to do that alone. And if not, she won't do it. Now, those of us outside of that situation don't realize the many and broad legal issues that surround assault. And since we're here, let's just jump into that real quick. Uh, some legal issues and HR issues that surround this. Can you inform us a little bit about uh, what women are up against in these situations <clears throat> and men? Because rape doesn't only happen to women. Right. Women and men and children, you know, people of all backgrounds, people of all genders. Um, it's tough because, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not uh, a judge, you know, I'm not a police officer, um, and I'm not a politician. So uh, what I do know is that this is, is uh, the least reported violent crime, and so often it's, it's kind of hidden in secrecy and shame, and so often there's really not much evidence or any evidence at all. So when people are possibly pursuing uh, legal action, it's very difficult for many reasons. It's very difficult to talk to someone about these issues. It's difficult to talk to police. It's difficult to, uh, if you know the perpetrator, to actually speak against that person that you know, even if, you know, it could be a family member or a close friend. Um, so there's all these different reasons, but also if there's no evidence at all, even if a district attorney, um, you know, 
would love to per pursue this in court, uh, they might not be able to because there's just no way they could ever get a conviction at all. So even people within the court system want to work with people and try to help them. But sometimes given the lack of evidence, there's really nothing they can do. One of the main reasons why that's really never my focus, unless it is something is important to someone, uh, my focus is their life, their health, their empowerment, their growth, um, that to hopefully have this not, you know, cripple and destroy people and to let people know a big part of my message is to let people know that hope is out there. Hope really does exist. People really do heal. People really do live functional and healthy lives with relationships, marriages with children, uh, throughout their lives, even through something as horrific as this. What are the financial implications for someone who has experienced assault? Could be many different things. Um, if it could be housing, what if, um, you're essentially, uh, if you're married and your health, if your husband is, uh, sexually abusing you, you try to leave. Um, if, especially if that person controlled the finances or, um, you know, uh, now you have to get your own apartment, possibly, you know, all those kinds of different issues with moving could be quite expensive. Um, there could be, uh, many different financial reasons. If you look at the healthcare system or just, um, you know, uh, having to possibly go to therapy if they choose to pay, but if they don't have insurance, uh, housing is a big one. Um, but also you look at maybe our prison population and many of our, many of our female inmates specifically, um, have been sexually abused, abused in many different ways. Um, there's definitely a massive connection of our prison population to sexual abuse and that costs taxpayers uh, tons of money. So that's kind of two different ways in which this could affect people's finances. Or even if someone really is struggling and what if they can't function in their job? What if they, you know, can't, uh, if they, uh, possibly drop out of school or again, can't function of the job, but they ultimately become addicted to substances of how that can trickle down into finances. Now I'm sitting here thinking that if an assault happens, you may or may not want to report it, as you have mentioned. Mm -hmm. And no judgment either way there. A mm -hmm. person has to do what is best for him or her. However, healing has to happen. Mm. So if someone has been assaulted and they have a full-time job, how do they move forward there? What if they're not ready to talk about it, but they need time off? How do you manage that situation? Really difficult. I don't think there's an easy answer to that at all. Um, I think many people don't take time off. They, one woman recently said to me, she couldn't fathom how people can experience, you know, certain kinds of trauma and then kind of get on with their day and just kind of almost put on a face. Cause I think she can't do that. Um, so I think people all around us, you know, all around us are going to school, work, being with their families and hiding a lot. Um, I think we all hide things at times. Um, so not everyone does take time off. If, if that was, if there was a, an employer for sake of argument that, um, was open to giving extra time off for something given if they even knew the truth, um, that'd be a really interesting uh, conversation have. I don't know how many employers would do that, you know? Um, so I think many people just kind of go on with their days and they, they suffer often in silence and this can impact many different aspects of their lives. Um, almost all aspects of their lives. So, but it's really challenging. However, people can feel sometimes work is a great distraction, um, for people in suffering. Sometimes, um, it's really healthy to get out and go to work, you know? So it's a, it's a whole mixed up. Whole mix of yeah, that. unless the perpetrator is in the workplace, then that Absolutely. would be a whole yep. new layer of. Or maybe someone will try to uh, move from that job. Maybe they try to get into a different job. Um, maybe they try the best to get away. Or yeah, they have to see that person every day or most days in a week. Hmm. So many layers to this issue beyond yeah. what we see on TV in those popular TV police dramas. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of different ways, as we've mentioned, that you work in your environment to help folks that approach you. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it's like to go out to places and inform and educate folks. I love it. It's actually, you know, people really think it's incredibly depressing work and it can be at times, but it's actually 
awesome. It's incredibly fulfilling. And you see people who are really interested, really engaged. You see people shaking, you see people triggered. Um, and then you might be able to even have counseling on the spot and really impact per, uh, people's lives in that moment in time. But I love interacting with people. I love listening to people. And that's a big part of my work is actually listening. It's more important for me to listen uh, than to speak. So yeah, being out in communities, different events. Again, I keep mentioning schools, uh, being with our youth and really hearing from them is, is, is awesome. And I really love it. I, I recommend anyone if they, if they have a passion for it, if they feel a call to do this, to get involved and go do it. I know of maybe one, possibly two places to recommend to someone or to turn to if I needed those services, but I'm guessing they're a little more prevalent than what we might imagine. Is it difficult to get the word out that you exist, that these centers, these places for help are around in our communities? Oh, yeah. Uh, very difficult, but doesn't mean you don't keep trying. Yeah, for sure. And that's one well, of the reasons I'm very appreciative that you would speak to me today, you know, because this is one way out of many ways that we can get really good messages out to people. Yeah. What would you say to someone to be a support? If, um, if someone comes to me and tells me about an assault or an experience that they've had, mm -hmm. what would be your best wisdom for me to be a supportive person in that situation? I give a tool, it's an acronym called BLESS. So I ask you to bless them. Um, the B stands for believe. So if you, if someone comes to you and shares something, not just with assault, but anything, but specifically say with a rape or assault, to believe them. Uh, when people are not believed, it is causing immense danger and, and damage, just darkening. So believing them is, a, is just huge. Um, the L is to listen, right? So it's better to listen mm -hmm. than to speak. Um, and then when time comes, maybe you might say something or ask a question, uh, but listening is huge in this. Uh, the E is empathy. So try to empathize as best as you can, right? To do your best to try to attempt to understand what they might be going through, what they might be feeling, what they might be thinking. Um, the S is safety. So depending on the situation, um, to ensure their physical safety, mental, spiritual, emotional safety to the best of your abilities. Um, and the last one is to support, you know, so if they really just want to go grab an ice cream and watch a movie that, you know, you do that with them, you know, if they are like, no, I would love to, I want to go to the police and you go with them. Um, so really depending on what the needs are at the time. Is it helpful to say, how can I support you in this? Yeah. Yeah. How can I help you? Uh, is there anything I can do for you? What do you need? Instead of telling people what to do, it's really important to listen and ask them questions and, and see where they're really at. You know, some people would love to call a hotline. Many people don't. Some people would love to go in for counseling. Many people don't, you know. You know, trauma experts tell us that to heal from a trauma, there is so much to be gained by empathetic listening. Mm. That if someone can just speak through their experience to someone else, who mm -hmm. doesn't judge, doesn't okay. offer advice, just holds a place of safety and listening, that that is huge in healing. Is that your experience as well? A hundred percent. That's what I try to teach people to, to the best of my ability. And how do we do that best? And stop it, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, uh, everyone's different. And some people are so quick to judge. So people are so filled with anger and rage and they want vengeance. Um, other people are so shocked. You know, I've, we talked women and men and children are sexually abused. I can tell you that I've seen many men who have looked even worse than their female partners because they just recently learned that the women they love were raped. Um, so now they're in a deep depression. They don't know what to do. Right. Um, so even listening to them. Uh, so yeah, I think it's just important for people to stop talking so much and get out of their own self, get out of their own head and just attempt to try to put themselves with someone, meeting them where they're at, you know, wherever that may be. And it changes in time. It can change and it changes in many different ways. Uh, but in that moment of time, whatever it is to just 
sit with them, be with them, as you already said. And if you do that, you can change your life, possibly even save a life. Mm. That's profound. How did you all get into by, it? All by simple listening. It's not, that com- it's not that complicated. It's quite simple. And we have the ability to do it. It's pretty miraculous when you think about it. Yeah. How did you get into this work? I was a college senior. Um, I took a class called Women in Crime. So we were learning about, you know, uh, female inmates, female gang members, female aspects of criminal justice. And there was a court, we would read a book on rape and uh, women from a local crisis center came and spoke to our class. And these three women walked in and they were like angels to me. I found them to be so strong and so gentle. And I was really in awe with them that they did this like full time. Like, how, how do they do this, you know? And then um, they gave this amazing training and they showed us a six minute interview of a perpetrator, a reenactment of a perpetrator. And I was so angry and that rage scared me, actually, that rage um, then turned into like a deep disgust where I thought I was going to throw up in my chair in, in class. And I knew God was working in me. And um, I heard God, I heard it's, I heard God say, will you help? And I was so nervous and so scared and every negative thing came at me. And, um, I ultimately just said yes. And I asked these women after class, uh, if I could volunteer, there were volunteer opportunities and, uh, they took my information. I ultimately beat a couple of people off for an internship. Um, and my life's never been the same. I've been doing it ever since. And you've written a book about it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with me. I've been able to read through that. And it's really opened my eyes to the many different ways that this impacts a person's life, Mm -hmm. especially the, the legalities, the workplace. Uh, I had a me too moment back in the eighties when I was in training with the military Mm -hmm. and, you know, back then it was a much different day than it is right now. Although many things still remain the same, but one of the things that I took away from that is Even though I prevented the assault, I wasn't assaulted and I didn't do anything wrong, but it was so hard to talk about it. It was so hard to tell that story. And I felt guilt. I felt shame and I did nothing wrong. I did everything right. Mm -hmm. And it's really crippling for anyone to relate those events, to talk about it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. How are you doing now? Would you like to talk more about that or no? I have had a long time to heal and to talk about it and to spend time with people who were empathetic listeners. Even at that time, I had some allies and that made all the difference to me. Mm. The people that I trained with, the men that I trained with supported me Mm -hmm. and that made it possible to heal. Mm. It would have been a much different situation otherwise. That's awesome. Yeah. If I was with you in person, I might ask to give you a hug, but. (laughs) I would take it. Okay, cool. (laughs) But I think that's something we can't overlook, that telling a story brings about so many negative feelings. Yeah. Even if it's not logical. Right. And to give people space to experience that. And then you say, thank you, you know, for your strength to share that. Um, to me and to anyone seeing this and you're right you didn't do anything wrong and it is heartbreaking when people are judged and condemned and blamed for these things when they do nothing wrong that is one of the deepest parts of this the self-blame that people feel and then the blame that comes at them from too many people so I'm very thankful that you had people that treated you well and you see how different your life has been and how different it can go in the negative way and in the destructive way when we don't believe you, when we don't listen to you, when we treat you poorly, when we blame you. This is causing deep destruction in human beings and in this world. Um, and I'm trying my best to change that in any way I can. And you clearly are as well. Absolutely. And because of the experience I had with other people's support and encouragement, that became one of the most um, strongest times in my life. 
that was a hard time, one of the difficult times, but it became an experience that really gave me strength. Had mm-hmm. that gone a different way with the support of other people being lacking, that would have been a much different outcome. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Even though there wasn't an assault. And I think we need to highlight that, that uh, an individual doesn't have to have intense physical assault to have huge reactions. Sure. Absolutely. Obviously, when it happens, there is a huge reaction, but never underscore a person's experience thinking, well, the worst didn't happen because to them it's dead. Agreed. And how it changes so much and how it can still last in time. For sure. And it's important that men are involved in this work too. It is. It's important for men. Sorry, I was just going to say it's important for men to get involved if they choose to be kind and loving to their, you know, to our women, to our men. It's important for people to understand that women commit assaults and that our men, some of our men are very angry and depressed and addicted. Because of sexual abuse they've experienced as adults or mostly, uh, mostly children. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a serious problem. And anyone, if people out there really do want to get involved, they can. They have, the, they have the tools. If their heart is in the right place and they genuinely care about this, they can, again, impact and possibly save lives. You know, look at what you're telling me right now. Look at the impact you've had of your own experiences and what people have done uh, for you and with you um, and how special that really is. And I want to thank you for doing the work you do. Thank you. I'll try my best. I try my best. Shall we talk about your book a little bit? <laughs> if you want to, like I said, if I was there, I'd give you some tissues too. Um, yeah. Um, how are you doing now, by the way, before I talk about my book? Is it okay? Are you okay to express this now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Uh, yeah. My book to the survivor is about. My journey as a rape crisis counselor with true stories of women and men, one transgendered man who've been raped and sexually assaulted. Um, so with all their own words, there is uh, interviews, written stories, and poetry. You know, you and I have spoken today about uh, speaking, but there's many different ways we can get this stuff out. And some of that is through writing, right? So if people, uh, writing can be a very powerful way uh, to express yourself and to heal from anything painful in your life. Um, so it shows what happened to them, how it happened, how it hurt them, but how they've come out of it. So it's not as depressing as many think, even though it's very difficult to read for so many. And it's very, it's very intense. So if someone's out there that doesn't want to read it, they shouldn't, right? You don't have to, you know, but knowing that enough that it is out there and it exists. And if there ever comes a time you want to check it out, feel free to, because I believe these stories are so um, powerful. There's just power and truth. And uh, seeing how they've come out of it is is pretty inspirational to me. Um, but it deals with many different issues, issues of legality, um, of justice and injustice. Uh, it deals with philosophy and spirituality, um, depression. You know, someone doesn't have to be sexually abused uh, to be suicidal or depressed, you know. Um, so it, it, it deals with a lot. Um, but I hope that it can be a beneficial resource in this world. One of the benefits that I experienced reading this book, it was opening my eyes to the many and broad impacts in a person's life. Mm. The uh, issue of the woman in the workplace. I don't want to tell HR what happened to me, but I need time off. You know, we don't think about those things, Mm -hmm. but those are out there. And if we work in a, a place where someone can come to us and need to ask for grace without giving details, maybe this book can help us understand that there are issues that we don't know about and maybe we don't need to know about, but we can extend a little grace in those situations. Um, Yeah, the book, there are stories, frankly, that I skip because I didn't want to go there. Yeah, And there were, uh, I really appreciated the different manifestations of the agency you work with their Mm -hmm. legal department and their advocacy department that there are Mm -hmm. so many ways to be involved in this work yeah i I love what you just said that you skipped over it more than okay 
Um, I, I hope anyone does that. And like I said, if they want to check it out, if you want to know what it was like, you know, for a man who was sexually abused as a kid, you can flip to the chapter gym. Uh, if you don't, don't, you know, I kind of wrote in a certain way that you can pinpoint where you want to go with it. Um, so I'm really glad you did that. And that sounded like a safe choice. And that's awesome. Um, and tell us the name of the book and where we can find it. The name of the book is called Tuba Survivors, and you can find it really on any online retailer. If you just go to Amazon.com, buy some mobiles, you can just type in uh, my name or the book, uh, and it will show up. And the links are in the show notes. So if you're listening to this and you want to check out the books, just go to the description, the podcast description, or the show notes and click that link there, and it'll take you right there to get a copy. So we've talked about a lot of different aspects of of all of this. I'm going to let you have the last words as we close today. What would you like to share that we haven't talked about yet? What do you really want people to know? Well, first, I just thank you again, you know, for having me on and for opening up and being vulnerable. You know, you doing that does resonate with people and it does Mm -hmm connects with people and I think it even gives some people permission and maybe more confidence to open up to someone right and I can't stress this enough it doesn't have to be me there's many people that don't speak to me and that's totally that's more than okay right um but to really open up to someone you know you love and trust someone that will really treat you well and if you do that and you are treated well if you're treated poorly to find someone else to not keep this inside because it will really hurt you. Um, so to find that right person, the right organization, whatever services you need, there are things out there. There are people out there. There are uh, people who will sit and listen to you. Nothing that you have experienced is unspeakable. Nothing can't be dealt with as long as you stay alive on this earth. As long as you stay alive on this earth, we can deal with anything uh, that comes. Um, so knowing that things are out there and that people really do heal and you're obviously Uh, an example of that so can't thank you enough and to just tell people that you're not alone never alone and not your fault to anything that happened to you of what someone else did and i love that message you can heal you can heal even if it doesn't feel like it at the moment Mm -hmm. know that you can heal you absolutely can thank you bobby yeah thank you very much